All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Unspoken Rules from Mutters to Mutters, Inspiring Journeys of Biology Alums panel, hosted by the Office of Career Services and the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. My name is Natasha Jones. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a career advisor in the Office of Career Services. Today, we have Daniel Garcia, class of 2010, Dan Prima, class of 1998, and Maureen Ruiz Sundstrom, class of 2010, um, who will talk to us about their experiences as biology alums. Our moderator today will be Armand Kosru from class of 2025, and this event will be recorded and shared on HMC's YouTube channel. We'll take questions at the end of the event, but please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. Um, and for those that are with us in the viewing party, um, feel free to ask us your questions and we can ask them here. Um, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. I'll moderate the Q&A toward the end of the panel um, and Armand will ask the main questions. So without further ado, Armand, I'll take it away. Thanks very much. Yep, hello, um, I'm Armand. I'm a math comp bio major of class of 2025. Um, my pronouns are he, they. Um, and I'm very excited to get to speak with the alumni and get to get some insight on what the post undergrad, the post mod experience is like for our industry. Um, so as an introduction, could our panelists uh, briefly introduce themselves, share your name, your major, anything else you feel would be important to know? Um, and I think just going off of the Zoom order, Maureen, could you go first? For sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Maureen, uh, she, her, Aya. Uh, I, fun fact, was not a bio major. I was actually a neuroscience major off campus, which I chose to do through Pomona. And I did a bio minor at in through the agency bio department. Okay. Uh, sorry. And what is your current profession at the moment? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have been in higher education for the last 11 years, particularly uh, undergraduate admission. I work, used to work at the Harvey Mudd Office of Admission. That's where I built most of my career in higher ed. Um, prior to that, I had um, a couple of years where I taught, about a year and a half where I worked at a lab, but then solidly in higher ed admission for the last 10, uh, 11 years. Most recently, I switched to CMC, so just moved down the street, uh, still in admission. Lovely. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Daniel, if you would. Yeah, um, my name is Daniel Garcia, pronouns he, his. Um, uh, biology major, class of 2010, fellow classmate of Maureen. Um, I'm currently a scientist, so I'm in the bi biopharmaceutical industry. Um, I work at a biotech uh, in San Diego called Arcturus Therapeutics. Um, I work in preclinical drug discovery and research. Um, so my current role is to try and figure out new ways, new diseases to apply our technology. Um, looking for cures for sick patients and um, prior to this, I was at Ionis Pharmaceuticals. That's where I got my postdoctoral training. Um, and that was also in the pharmaceutical industry um, using RNA targeted therapeutics um, to, to, to try and treat diseases. Um, again, in preclinical research and drug discovery. Um, and I did, I got my PhD at UC San Diego in biomedical sciences. And I was doing uh, cancer research, but most of my experiences have been on cell biology, molecular biology. And I was born and raised in San Diego. I live in San Diego right now. So it's hard to leave. <laughs> Went to grad school here too. So I think I'm gonna stay here for a while. Okay. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, and of course, I'll see Dan, if you would. Sure, so I, um, un unlike most mothers, I ended up going to medical school after MUD. And I'm now a nuclear medicine physician at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, do a lot of cancer clinical trials and work in our cancer center. Um, yeah, born and raised in Chicago, then went to MUD, then did training in New York, and now I'm in Philadelphia. And, um, and we're pretty proud at kind of our mRNA work, so. Yeah, it sounds like great work. Um, so I think just to start getting an overview, can you describe your journey from graduation up until this point? Um, and what were the sort of pivotal moments that changed your career? So for example, like any confusion you had coming out of mud 
or if you were confident about what you wanted to do. Um, and we can go in reverse order this time. So Dan, if you'd like to start. Yeah, and so I'm like my journey to going to med school and then to becoming a nuclear medicine doctor was there was a lot of happenstance involved. Um, I learned very quickly that places that aren't mud aren't mud. And that mud is a very, very unique place where people are passionate and smart and eager to learn. And it was it was a tough adjustment in many cases. Um, but I think what I learned at mud is learning how to learn and that served me really, really well. Um, so it sort of didn't matter what happened. I was confident that I could work through it. And then um, just, I think the collaborative nature at mud has really helped me um, this sort of the picture of Thomas Edison at his desk in the dark working alone is it was a lie then um, and it's really a lie now like everything in science is is a team sport and so I think that that um, that's really helped me a lot over the years and and so yeah I think I just um, at every step I made decisions that seemed like they felt right at the time and most of it wasn't pre-planned and if you had told me even like two years ago that I'd be in the position I am right now, I would have thought it was not even in remotely in the realm of possibilities. And, and so it's been, it's been a fun ride. That's great. I love that phrase, learning how to learn, because every alumni, regardless of major, will always say that's what they learned at MUD. Um, but yeah, thank you for that answer. And Daniel, if you'd like to go next. Sure. Yeah. So my career trajectory has been pretty like traditional, I guess you would say. I after mud, I wanted to get more research experience, and so um, I took a gap year in between mud and grad school. Two years actually, I did research at um, the NIH National Institutes of Health in Maryland, and there um, I like solidified my desire to to do research. I was like. Yeah, the research is, is really what I want to do as a career. So that that helped me focus like my grad school apps and stuff like that. So um, I ended up applying for a fellowship and, and got it. And that helped me, that gave me funding. So it helped me um, not have to worry about what lab I chose. And so um, that was that was a pretty pivotal moment there because I could basically choose anywhere. And it really helped me open the door to any program that I wanted. And so, <clears throat> but yeah, that, that gap year was really, really beneficial for me. And um, so then did grad school at UC San Diego. Um, and during that time, I realized I didn't want to go into academia. Academia wasn't for me, the academic path. And so I started looking for, um, for the end of grad school, started looking for industry to, to jump into industry, industry position. But you know, it's really hard because a lot of the industry positions require industry experience. And so I was trying to find a way in and, and one way in is to do an industry postdoc. And that's similar to an academic postdoc, but it's just shorter and you get paid more and, um, and you get industry experience, obviously. So, so that made it easier for me to um, get into the industry um, without having industry experience, because um, that was the expectation for that sort of position. And then um, help me be competitive for scientist positions at, at companies. And so that's how I got to where I am now. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sure that industry PhD is something people would want to learn more about, because the stress of PhDs and how to get that doctorate is definitely on a lot of mothers' minds. Um, so yeah, thank you. And Maureen, if you would like to end us off on this question. Yeah, for sure. So I think <laughs> a lot of my experiences in life in general, I think has been painted by the fact that I am first generation and I'm also a daughter of immigrants. <laughs> so I think that for a really long time, even when I was at MUD and I'm picking my major, I just thought that I had to do what I was supposed to do. And I kind of like ignored the things that I knew deep in my heart that I wanted to do. So senior year, 
Um, actually, for the last couple of years at MUD, I was involved in ASHMIC. Senior year, I was ASHMIC president. So I had weekly meetings with our uh, dean of students at the time, Dean Browning. I had regular meetings with Maria, who was president uh, at the time. Uh, I got to set in into in like alumni board governors meetings, some like board trustees meetings. And so I always say that by the time that I was a senior and leaving MUD, there was some light foreshadowing that I'd be going back into higher ed, but it took me a minute to be okay with it. Um, I left MUD and I joined Teach for America. So I taught for two years, um, would not necessarily recommend that experience for many folks interested in, in education. Happy to at some point connect with folks offline if they have questions about that. Uh, when I finished my time at TFA, I taught, I should say, at an um, all-girls charter school in Colorado, um, and I taught uh, mostly science, some math as well uh, as some science electives, neuro electives, actually. Um, I worked at UCLA then in like my dream lab, the lab that I had hoped to one day join as a grad student, the lab that inspired my thesis work for a little bit over a year. And then uh, at the time, Judy Fisher was running a career services at MUD and she posted an entry level opening in the dean in the office of admission uh, at CMC and admission counselor job. And I think for me, I saw it back as a return to MUD, uh, like an entry point into higher ed. Uh, at the time, I I think also for real long time being first gen, I didn't know that higher ed jobs existed. Like obviously someone admitted me to college, but I never connected those dots that those were jobs and careers that you could have. Uh, and so, yeah, that that kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I joined HMC Admission where I grew quite a bit doing like leading multiple show recruitment um, onto like some like large program plannings and events. Then that brought me to data and eventually operations, which is the role that I'm in right now. So I'm a associate dean of admission at Claire McKenna, where I manage um, our CRM. So everything that's relating to our database uh, and all of our data flows. I also manage all operations, uh, things like that for the office. Um, eventually, since I became interested in this, I decided to go into grad school 11 years after leaving MUD. Uh, so I just graduated in May with my MA in education evaluation and data analysis. Um, and so, yeah, now I, I get to sit in kind of like we call it the enrollment leadership team within my office. Um, and so, yeah, I think in terms of like these ideas of like caring and collaboration and impact and some of the, 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 the things that I learned as far as like public speaking and writing, all of those skills that I learned at MUD really translated into all of these kind of different stages that I've, I've talked through. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for the variety of answers. I think that was very helpful for current students. Um, and I think one common thing that kind of sounded like was helpful throughout all of your journeys was just social networking and knowing the right people to help you get into the right industry. Um, so how has social networking played a role in your careers? Because I know that's a question a lot of mutters uh, think about. Is it something we should be starting now? Is it something we can put off? Or, so yeah, um, whoever would like to take this answer, if you'd like to unmute, go for it. I, I can go first. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think for me, I interestingly had a good number of connections of folks that were working either in admission or, or higher ed who were really helpful when I started having, you know, the idea of coming back into higher ed or going into higher ed. I think since, um, since I've been in my role for the last 11 years, I've just really focused a lot on developing relationships with folks at public school districts, with um, folks at independent schools. And my own, I'm lucky I feel that I have a professional organization that's really active. So we have the NACAC, which is at the national level, and WACAC, which is for the Western region, so California and Nevada. And so I've been able to grow my networks there. Um, I think also I've been able to grow a little bit of my networks with both um, within my places of employment. So collaborating with other departments within the colleges, which has then led to broader collaborations with folks in, in other areas of higher ed uh, and through like the independent sector for California colleges and universities. Um, 
I will also say it played a really big role in terms of finding out about the role that I'm in now and having a lot of conversations that made me feel like I was ready, even though I did not have experience leading operations for our office, that I was ready to tackle this challenge. Um, so it's definitely played a really, really, really big role in in my my own path. And I'll just I so I've I've never left academia in my career, um, and and mentorship is really important, and I'm sure it is in every industry, um, but there are a lot in, in academics. There's sort of formal mentoring opportunities, and it's ingrained, um, and you need mentors and you need sponsors, and and you always need those people. And I think that um, just the the closeness of the faculty with the students at Mud made it a lot easier for me to to not be sort of starstruck by these very senior people and just kind of like have conversations with them. And, and that really helps to build those relationships and, and just being open and genuine and, and those sorts of, we don't really have water coolers anymore, but the water cooler conversations um, uh, really have helped to foster the relationships. And then, um, things happen and, and things build and it, it's really great. And then you kind of sort of start that cycle and, and help then the next generation come through and, and it, it really, I think helps. And so while there aren't as many former mutters floating around, um, I think that there's still the, the opportunities to, to really get to know people and, and to use the, the skills you have from kind of the, the non-hierarchical structure that is mud, I think really helps, especially in, I've been in sort of East Coast Ivy League snooty places that um, that's sort of, that's not the norm. And, and we've tried to make it the norm and it's really, really been great. Yeah, I can add to that. Um, it, networking is essential for sure. I, it's, it's helped me get every job that I've had pretty much. Um, my current job, um, I got through a a mother connection, um, Liz Allen, class of 09, she worked at this company and um, yeah, she helped refer me for, for the role. So, so yeah, you never know who, who you are, who or what is going to be, you know, helping you out in your career. So it's, it's the thing I could tell you is just meet as many people as you can and then make as many connections as you can while, while you're at mud and, and even, even professors. Um, I had a, um, a professor help me get get the fellowship i mean he didn't help me get the fellowship but he helped me prep my application for the fellowship and um this was professor asai he was um uh, a former mud faculty that left mud and and joined the um howard hughes medical institute which is the the fellowship granting institution that that i applied to and um he wasn't in the same department but he he helped me prep my application in order to be successful. And if I hadn't made that connection with him while he was at MUD, um, I don't think I would have been as successful there at, um, as I was. And so even that, you know, like applying for applying for grad school, applying for fellowships, networking is, is helpful there too. Um, <clears throat> like reaching out, I, I've, I've reached out to people like on LinkedIn and just cold, cold messaging basically. And ask, just asking if they're open to chat and, and, um, you know, answer some of my questions and I've gotten like a 50% response rate, even for people who I've never met before. So it's possible to get in and, and make a quick connection and have a conversation with someone. Um, you just got to be open to it. And I remember as a grad student, I remember hating when people said, oh, you got to do networking. You got to do networking. Like, I'm an introvert. So like, it was kind of hard for me to like put myself out there and, and, and talk and, and have conversations. Um, but it really is, uh, yeah, I just hated the, I, I, I just hated the idea of it because I, I felt like, you know, your resume should speak for itself, you know, and your work should speak for itself. But it's it's really the connections that you make um, and because it, it really humanizes you as opposed to just a piece of paper that, that comes across someone's desk. And so those those connections really do help in every stage of your career. If I can add one more thing also, just not sleeping on those 5C connections too. Like, especially I think the further you go away from like Claremont, as soon as you step out of Claremont, like we are all just so excited <laughs> to meet each other, to connect with other 5C, 4C alums. 
Um, so that's also something that I've really appreciated, right? Even in my field in education, just running into folks that went to Pomona, that used to work at Pitzer, that, you know, whose daughter is going to Scripps. Like there's just a lot of excitement around those connections too. And a lot of opportunities for networking and for engaging and building relationships with folks too. Hey, great, thank you very much for these answers. Um, so to me, it sounds like kind of networking is one of the mediums through which you were able to find these jobs, which to this, to me, sounds like jobs which fit your ideals um, and what you want to do in life. So how were you, what other mediums were you using to kind of find these opportunities? So for example, I think one, if Daniel, you'd like to start with this, um, the way I'm thinking is, how are you able to plan out taking a gap year and then returning to post, uh, to pursue a postdoc? So I think that's something people, a lot of people would like to do, but it's quite difficult to plan in this stage. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the the driving thing for me was that I think at the time when I was at LED, the by department was pretty small, and so there weren't that many research opportunities available. Um, and so there were a few, but I think I wanted to go into a, the biomedical field. And I think we were kind of lacking in that space. Um, and so uh, I think that's what drove me to try and get more research experience before deciding to pursue that as a career. And so um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would recommend looking into post -bac programs that are research-based and they have these sorts of programs at a lot of different institutions called um, universities um, obviously the NIH that are that help you get research experience um, and they're meant for recent grads so there's a lot of these types, sorts of programs and um, and so yeah I, I applied to those instead of applying to grad school I feel like I didn't have the bandwidth at the time as a senior to apply to grad school because I know it's a lot of work preparing the application, you know, getting all your recommendations in line, and even interviews, um, the grad school interview process, you know, you have to fly out to the school and interview in person. And um, that takes time away from, you know, your coursework and stuff like that. So at the time, I feel like I didn't have the bandwidth to do to do that. But the post back application process is a little less intensive. And so um, and even, even um, the post back programs, that, that's not the only route to try and get more research experience in a gap year, you could really literally just apply to research um, assistant or research technician positions at universities that um, have research, you know, research labs there. And so that's another way to do it. Yeah, I'll echo that one. As someone who keeps trying to hire people for the lab, there is a national postdoc crisis. There's not a lot of postdocs. And so labs have had to pivot and how how to get people and so there there's a lot of openness to if someone's got some lab skills and if you've got good hands um, and you want to just spend a couple of years learning about stuff you will have at many labs and many academic institutions they'll be very happy to hire you and you're not gonna have to pay tuition you'll actually get paid um, and and it can be a really a great opportunity and depending on on what you think you may want to do after that because it can change but um, you can pick a lab where it's someone who maybe has some some sway in that field and and can help you with the grad school applications or or whatever's next. I can talk about uh, a little bit of my experience. So as, as you asked this question, um, I can't sing enough praises about just so many of the departments like Steph um, and not going to have departments at, at MUD, right? So two of my jobs, right? I've had is it four. Yeah, four jobs since I graduated. Uh, two of those I actually got through <laughs> agency career services because they just let me know about people that were hiring or interviewing around campus. Um, I think also you will find um, in your in your field just the way that folks either post jobs or look for recommendations because I'm in education, actually Facebook is really big is the main reason why I still have a Facebook account as much as I hate it. Uh, so I think we see at this point, right? So I'm in a couple of Facebook groups for, you know, like 
folks of color in admissions and and like both in the high school and the college side, the more general like college admission counseling group where a lot of positions get posted. Um, there's a group for the CRM that we use is called Technolution Slate. So there's one for Slate folks where a lot of the more like technical CRM jobs get posted. Beyond admission, I think the places where for folks that might be interested in, in higher ed, just in case any of you out there are, uh, higher ed jobs is a good one. The Chronicle for Higher Education, which is a publication and Inside Higher Ed, also another kind of publication, they, they will list a number of jobs. Some of those actually will be academic jobs or like high level like administrative jobs as well. Um, and then I think just like the professional organizations, right? So for me, for myself, I have NACAC, which is the National Association for College Admission Counselors. There's ACRO, which is for registrars and admission officers, AIR, which is for folks in institutional research. So a lot of those will have their own job listings as well. And I think for folks that may also be interested in going in like the maybe not necessarily education, but nonprofits. I know a bunch of folks that have found things through like Idealist and other searches like that, that will post jobs or job fairs or things like that relating more to nonprofit or different different sectors within um, different fields or disciplines within the, the non, nonprofit sector. Okay, great, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so when, as we're talking about these kind of pursuits of your goals and how you've managed to achieve them would there be any advice or multiple pieces of advice because we always appreciate the help that you would like to give that you think would be helpful if you're to give to you who have just who had just graduated out of harvey mudd i mean i think just just follow your passion and do something that makes you happy because if you're miserable going to work in the morning, you're going to be really miserable when you're leaving late at night. And um, obviously it's, it's, there are times when the hours are really long. And a lot of times those are the really fun times um, when you're doing what you want to be doing. And so there are so many options. You, you've heard three really diverse things from people with pretty similar educational backgrounds. So there's so many permutations and everybody's different so just try stuff and be don't be too goal oriented um be more open to like or or i guess the goal should be finding the thing you want as opposed to the position and um i, I just i think that there's just it's an infinite number of things that you could be doing and so um why why do the one that you don't actually really want to be doing Uh, I can go next. I think for me, what I wish someone had told me when I was leaving mud and even even now is that I'm not in a rush. I think there's times when I feel like, oh, I already missed the boat or I already messed this up because I'm not in this job or I'm not like I wish I'd known this before. So just knowing, you know, that you're going to be fine and you're not in a rush and it's okay if it takes you a minute to figure out what what you want or what direction you want to go in or that you want to change directions um something else i think is just the idea that people love to talk about themselves uh so i think leveraging those connections and those spaces that we were talking about today those like be it virtual spaces or in-person spaces conferences what have you just to ask for like informal conversations. How did you get into this pathway? How did you know that? Um, what have you been looking for in, in positions when you've hired or when you've added someone to your lab? Folks will be happy to chat about any of those. And then I think for me, uh, um, Dan mentioned LinkedIn before. LinkedIn has been a huge tool for me in addition to Facebook, which unfortunately is big in education, as I mentioned before. Uh, just um, spend time, like invest time in your LinkedIn profile. I think that has been, that has been really, really helpful for me as well. Yeah, I just want to reiterate one of Maureen's points about informally informal conversations with people. Um, the way I've heard them referred to as is an informational interview. So um, you just, yeah, reach out to someone and, and ask them how they got to where they are. Like find someone whose job you think is interesting that would interest you and and see how they got there. You know, no one's no one's path is direct and, and everyone has a different path. So just, just to see what, and then in the, in the instances when I've done this, um, I agree, people do like talking about themselves. So if you just ask that simple question, they'll, they'll take you on, I don't know how many tangents, but um more than that, it's like more than learning about 
how they got there. It's also kind of planting a seed in that, like now that person knows that you're interested and motivated and that sort of thing. So if an opportunity comes up across their desk, they might remember, oh, I talked to that person about this. Why don't I shoot them an email? You know, just just they're they're in your mind, they're in their mind now that um that after that connection or the conversation, especially if it went well. So um, I would really lean on the informational interview as as a good tool. Trying to figure it out. Totally. And and when you find that person who has your dream job, it's it's really nice to hear that they didn't like get that job right out of school. Um, there was there was many steps to, that got them there, and some of them were were a lot of work and maybe not not always great, but were were learning experiences. Thank you very much. Um, and thinking back on some of the answers you've had, I think one thing that stuck out to me was Dan when he said, "If you had told the you of two years ago what you're doing right now, you wouldn't have believed it." Um, so at this point in your career, how, uh, how confident are you about what you want the course of your career to go out? Um, and are your current career workings going towards that goal or is it still more of a, you follow your passion at this point? Yeah. Sorry, if Dan, if you'd like to go yeah. first. I'm still following it. Um, I don't know what's next and that's okay. I've gotten pretty comfortable with that. Um, in, in some ways, as you progress in your career, in some ways, the opportunities may get narrower in other ways, they got much more wider. I mean, you can make different jumps. Um, and I've never really tried to follow any kind of a linear path. And so I think that's been pretty liberating. So yeah, I don't I don't know what's in two years. I have some ideas of what could be, and there's some that are could be really cool, but I don't know. I'm not I'm not beating down the doors to try to get to them because I'm just yeah, we'll see. I think for me, um I'll I'll Actually, in my answer to this, I'll go back to another piece of advice from a previous question, I think. So education and, and like ed admin can be quite hierarchical. And so I think sometimes, especially earlier in the field, when I was younger in the field, I felt really overwhelmed by this push of everyone just being like, are you going to get promoted? If Are you looking? If you don't get promoted, are you going to move? What are you doing? Where are you going? Right. Because of this idea that you had to, you know, just spend a few years here, then move on to this other position, this other position. And so I think for me, I've come to just realize that it's OK to stay if I feel like my my voice carries weight in my office, if I feel that I'm working at a transformational place. And so I've tried to kind of not let my mind get caught a bit in, in, in that rat race. Right. And so that brings me to your answer here. I, I stick around. Right. I think for as long as, as I feel like I'm working at a transformational institution, I'm doing work that I find interesting and that there's room to grow my skills and the things that I'm exploring. I, I don't necessarily see myself necessarily moving elsewhere. I do think when I think further into the future, I'll likely stick with higher ed. Um, my grad program had a lot of on like data analytics and data storytelling and visualization. So I could potentially at some point see myself moving to like a maybe like a nonprofit side, maybe doing something relating to that. In higher ed, I'm not sure if I'll stay in enrollment forever. I am sometimes really drawn to registrar roles or institutional research. Um, in admission, folks, especially a lot of women, tend to feel like they need to switch to the high school side, uh, especially as they start kind of thinking more about having a family. Um, so I think I, I, it's something you see very commonly in my field. I don't see myself going in that direction because I don't want to deal with with parents at, at uh, independent schools. And also because I don't want to be responsible for a single child or if someone says you were his counselor or her counselor. So I definitely don't see myself moving in that direction. But yeah, likely sticking around on the higher ed side for a bit. Yeah, for me, I, I think I am where I thought I would be at this point. Yeah, like my, when I was at MUD, I remember like the idea of being a researcher 
kind of crystallized for me. Like I was taking, I remember Professor Valsberg's class on chemistry and living systems and learning about structure and function, structure and function of proteins, but in the context of diseases, you know, like how we learned how flu virus works and how it infects cells and how the drugs work to combat that. And so like that interested me so much. And I think that's what set me off on the path of like, I want to do research, biological research that can one day help people and diseases. And so that's basically what I'm working on right now. And I think I, I really like doing like doing experiments, doing studies, get, generating data that shows that this thing works to potentially cure this disease. And so that's my, my goal is to like someday work on a, pro, um, a drug that eventually gets approved by the FDA and, and that can benefit patients. And so I know that's, that's a, that's a dull task and there's a lot of failure in that, but I think I'm, I'm happy for where I'm at right now because I think the products I'm working on have huge potential, um, especially with, you know, the, the huge interest, public interest in mRNA therapeutics. And that's, that's what we're working on right now. And just taking advantage of that opportunity at this company to, to work on that, I think is, is really cool. And so, but looking to the future, I probably won't be see myself working in the lab you know as as i get older um but i could see myself being in more of like a leadership position like leading multiple scientists working on drug discovery projects for diseases and maybe like guiding strategy for a company like we should pursue these diseases or we should um, improve our technology in this way that sort of thing and, and more of like a leadership and strategy type of role instead of you know in the lab generating data all the time and so but that's where i'm at right now i, I like doing the, doing experiments getting the data showing showing that it works generating value in that way and then moving projects forward like that lovely thank you very much for these answers um and i also want to leave some time for the participants who are viewing this so i don't uh dominate all the questions so i think now would be a good time if any of the participants want to start getting their questions in, either in person or online. Um, and while we wait for that, I can start us off with one that a medical, an aspiring medical student had asked me is uh, the target at Dan is the biology in Harvey Mudd tends to be very general. And you talk about how we learn to learn and that helps a lot. But I think a lot of people have this fear that going to med school, they're just not going to know as much as their peers who are more specialized in human anatomy or the field they want to pursue. So how did you navigate that? And was that just one of the places where you had to learn? There was no other way. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, I think from MUD, the trick was getting into med school um, because med school admissions like people with really high GPAs. Um, and, and the MCAT scores you'll probably get as a mudder helps to defray that. Um, but that was probably my biggest challenge. Once I got in, to be honest, like some of the stuff was holding you and, and you just have to learn. And there's a lot of memorization and you're basically learning a whole new language that first year. Um, but the, the classes were frankly kind of boring and easy. Um, like, like biochemistry as a med student was a lot easier than biochemistry at MUD. And, and so the biggest challenge really was, and I, this is obviously a stereotype and a blanket statement, but there's a lot of people who are pre-meds and they go to college for the sole purpose of getting into med school. And they want to like, what do I have to memorize to get to this point? And, and a lot of the teaching in med school was like, here, memorize this. And I just wanted to like, learn how to figure it out. Um, and, and so there, there was some friction there and, and it took some adjusting, but I think that really, yeah, your biggest challenge is, and you have to know that I think that there were schools that I couldn't get into out of mud just because, but I'm totally okay with that hundred percent. And, and it's served me well. And, um, yeah, so, so it's all worked out very well. I know I can't speak to this from my own experience, a uh, former biologist or a scientist or 
not a doctor uh, of, either, of any kind, but it's a question that we get asked a lot back when I was working mud admissions. I still get asked that question a lot now that I'm still in admissions, right? And and the truth is medical schools love liberal arts college grads for a reason. And it's this sense of inquiry, interdisciplinary understanding, thinking beyond your field. You know all of these things, especially if you ever joined one of my information sessions at MUD or any information session, you've heard these things. And they really ring true, right? I think it's it's one of the things to keep in mind that you will definitely be able to leverage those like um, those skills that you've developed at MUD, right? And it's similar, even when you think about an engineering degree at MUD, we'd hear from our students that go to an electrical engineering program. They're like, oh yeah, well, I was a few classes short on some things because I didn't have an electrical engineering BS, but I got it, like, I just learned it, right? And then I was like full up to speed and I was able to learn it quickly because of the skills that I got from my time at MUD. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and as we start waiting for questions, Trula, and I can have some, some more individual questions that have come up throughout the uh, webinar. So I think remember, Maureen, you talked about how you started out in more kind of traditional biology post-mud experience, and then you kind of pivoted into something you're seemingly more passionate about, which is great. Um, but that pivot itself seems a lot harder, I think, for a lot of people who are coming out of STEM and a very STEM environment. So how were you able to pursue that pivot? Um, and how did that, what difficulties did you face in that journey? I think for me, I had the benefit that I, I went, my first thing was education, right? Cause I was teaching and I was teaching at a brand new charter school in Colorado um, where we had true like social economic diversity and uh, very, different ranges of, of like knowledge and ability and prior exposure with, with our, our girls, right? And so I think I was just very much enjoying the teaching side of it uh, and things like that. But I think just really thinking about STEM education and access to STEM education and, and things like that, right? And looking forward and thinking forward to to my girls and what path they were, they were gonna take, uh, particularly those that seemed drawn to science. Um, and then after that, I went to, I did what in my mind I, I thought I had to do, right? And I found this lab job um, at a lab that I loved, right? And I was managing a very large um, mouse colony and it was a very small lab. <laughs> so there was one grad student, a CMC neuro grad actually, two postdocs and RPI. And so I spent just like hours <laughs> alone in, in the mouse room in the basement, uh, which was fine. And at the time I was really enjoying it because I really loved all the work coming out of that lab for years, right? But I think um, I, my, my, the, the grad student, uh, their, their spouse worked in CMC admission. And I just love spending time with them and just hearing more about the work that they were doing in education. And so I think for me, I had the, I, I had this moment where I realized just how much I missed conversations about access to STEM education, which kind of helped bridge that gap, right? And, and made me feel okay. It just made me realize that this next move made sense for myself. Um, and then I called my dad crying because I was very confused and I felt like I had wasted all of this like time and effort at mud. And then he's like, this makes sense. What are you doing? Just calm down, <laughs> stop crying. And then I applied for that job. So I think it was like a little bit harder for me because I felt uh, it took me a moment to realize, I think, just being first gen and, and being from like an immigrant family and, and everything, I think I always thought my path was like really linear. And it wasn't until I was at that point that I realized like, oh, it was, it was always a fan, right? It was just folded and I can go in all of these directions and leverage all of these past experiences. Have your fingers healed yet from all the mouse bites? I wouldn't get by, I was really good at my job. Right. <laughs> I didn't get that many. <laughs> they can be ornery. Oh yeah, thank you so much for that answer. I think that completely answered the point I was trying to get at. Um, so we have a question from a participant for Dan and slash or Daniel. So did either of you consider getting an MD PhD while thinking about your post mod plans? And if so, uh, how did you decide to get either an MD or PhD over trying to get both? So Daniel, if you'd like to start this off. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Did I ever consider it an MD, PhD? Uh, no, <laughs> never considered it. Yeah, I did. Um, I was really focused on the research side of it, and then I, I didn't really have any interest on the on the patient side. I think. Um, I mean, part of it was the length of the training that was required for that that path, and and I, I didn't think that was for me. Um, and and yeah. Yeah, I can't speak much to the MD PhD track. I, I didn't really know that many people who, who did that. Yeah, and I interestingly didn't consider it because I didn't know enough about it. Um, and that that was one of the the downsides to being a pre meta mod is is I didn't have that network of people who went to med school two years before. And there's one person a year before me, and then I didn't know anyone from from. I think there was one person like three years ahead of me. Um, so I just didn't know enough about it. And, um, and I, I think if all things were, if I were doing it all over again and I knew about it, I'd probably look into that a lot more closely. Um, I ended up through crazy happenstance, sort of, um, my boss left and I started squatting in his lab and then all of a sudden I had a lab and I'm a lab PI. Um, so <laughs> I ended up not needing to get the PhD, but, um, that, may not have happened the same way again so it would have it would have made some things easier to have done that um but yeah that's that's why i didn't consider it i i can talk a little bit more about that so i um know that there's you know once you have your md phd um i think it's kind of difficult for people to split their time in the clinic the treating patients and their time in the lab like running your research i think it's really hard to manage that and my, so my grad advisor, grad school advisor, he was an MD, but um, he ended up doing like a postdoctoral research fellowship for MDs. So, and then he ended up running a lab without having a PhD. So I, it's definitely possible to, to go that route and kind of go around <laughs> needing a PhD, but so it could be because he did it that way. But um, I remember he saw patients like on Friday afternoon, once a week. And the rest of the time was spent managing the research lab. So, and I don't know if there's, if, you know, if you kind of have, person who asked this question, I don't know if you have a, a, a vision of how you want your job to look like, you know, do, do you want to only see patients once a week or do you want to be like in the clinic all the time? Um, and that's something that you've got to, you know, ask yourself, you know, what, what you want your job to look like once you once you get out of that training okay yeah so one more question from our participants what does what do industry jobs for biology look like and i think this is kind of a very broad industry. So I suppose you can only speak about your own industry. Um, but if you would like to go, I think Dan and Daniel and then Maureen. Daniel, do you want to go first? You've got the most chance of a real answer. Yeah. So what, what do industry jobs look like? Yeah. Sorry. So I think um, to try to narrow down the question, because it is quite a broad question. Um, in your case, it seems like you ended up going a more like mod research side, whereas uh, Maureen completely went into education and Dan has gone somewhere in the middle where he's working in education while still working in biology. So I think those kind of transitions and how your specific transition, your specific area, uh, an industry job in that area would look like. So, I, I mean, in, industry is. So at least for the pharmaceutical industry, there there's so many different types of jobs that you can you can have. You know, a, a pharmaceutical company is, you know, um, it has so many different functions. You know, you could there's a there's a legal function like so there are scientists that work in the in the legal department. So you could even, um, you know, if you have interest in law, you can you can kind of go that route and leverage your science background to into like patent law or um, business transactions. There's also business development side of the company, making deals with other companies. So you definitely need a science background for that sort of thing because you need to understand 
um, the technology behind the different companies and how they can work together to make a good partnership and a, and a business deal. Um, yeah, there's there's a ton of other, um, I guess, like kind of career trajectories within pharmaceutical and biotech industry that aren't always research or research-based. Um, let me see if I can think of another one. Yeah, so I'm, I'm in preclinical research, but there's also the clinical side. And so there's a lot of people that work in operations around clinical trials and all of that really difficult work of recruiting patients and um, you know making sure the samples and the data get, get in correctly and analyzing the data. There's also communication, science communication. So like um, companies need to release their data um, to satisfy the investors. And so presenting the data and information in a way that's um, suitable for that context is another like department's job. And so having a science background there is, is important as well. Yeah, for sure. On the clinical research side, there's like a, so many different opportunities just from the academic side, the industry side, um, whether it's imaging or biomarkers or patient stuff, or um, you can be hands-on with the patient, you can be doing regulatory things. Um, and and that that's the area that I know the best. And, and there's just a ton of different jobs where, where having that biology background is really, really vital and important. Um, and then, I mean, just biology is obviously a very broad field. There's a ton of industry and, and things where we're understanding how organisms work can, can help you. And so anything from agriculture to um, uh, whatever you can think of there, there are, so there are lots of job opportunities and, um, and ultimately I think at some point in your career, your major matters less than your interest and your passion. And, and so your major may give you a leg up into that first job, but um, if there's something that sounds cool, it, you know, it's the job market's tough enough that like, if you apply and, and, and you show that you're smart and ambitious, you've got a good chance, even if it's not exactly, you don't think it's in your wheelhouse and you will find that what you learn in your major will help you, even if it's not obvious that it, it, it is a good fit. I think in, in education, there's just, uh, you can go in so many different routes, right? Whether it's like, you know, like feet on the ground doing things from, you know, like in admissions alone, being more of like a road warrior. Um, there's folks that are just traveling or recruiting. There's a good number of people that are regional uh, recruiters, right? So they might live in they might live in the like in California, but they're working for a school in the Midwest or something like that. Um, a lot for sure and more in terms of be it um, engagement with with direct students, be it advising. Um, you can go into a lot of work relating to policy, whether that's even, you know, if you're more um, going like the the like law school route, right? Like eventually becoming a, a general counsel for an institution or just being really interested or responsible for uh, managing academic policies and catalogs from an institution. Um, um, there's a good amount of, there's so much room for, for data right now, um, in a number of different fields across most offices, right? Just as, especially as funding has gone down and, and you need to justify more expenses. Um, a lot of room for sure also with, with IT. In reality, a lot of, of what I do now involves things like, be it, just like SQL or just like HTML, CSS because of, of the kind of job that I do. There's also so many consulting opportunities too. And so many companies that do consulting, whether it is even like IT stuff and like security, whether it's help with, with your CRM or your marketing, uh, whether it's financial modeling for colleges that don't get to be uh, need blind like like MUD is or like CMC is. So they need to do a lot more modeling and predictive analytics for their yields. Uh, 
So there's definitely a lot of different different rooms where different places and different a lot of room for your like mud skills, quantitative skills, computational skills to come into play as well. If that's if that's more your your vibe. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think that like personal insight into your industry is exactly what we were looking for. Um, I think I just want to respect everyone's time, so I'm going to pass along to Natasha for our closing remarks. And thank you so much for having these great answers, I think, at least for me, and I don't want to speak for everyone, but biology majors and mud majors, a lot of our anxiety gets alleviated by alumni like you who help us through this transition. So thank you very much. You're all, you're all in a good place. <laughs> thank you. So I actually uh, wanted to ask one more, hopefully very quick question, um, but I love to end on a fun note. If there are maybe any funny, fun, silly mud memories that have lasted through the years that you hold uh, close to your heart. I can go first because mine actually involves Daniel. Uh, and I don't know if you actually know this, Daniel, but uh, when at some point the bio department reached out to us because of an NIH fellowship for the summer. And they're like, do you want to interview for this? Right. And so this was like, I think it was during our junior year because it was for that last summer. And so I remember showing up for my interview and it was uh, Prof. Adolf, Prof. McFadden and Prof. Driscoll, I think he was still there. And then I remember walking in and it was very much, I think centered, it was going to be right mobile cell bio work and I remember walking into that interview and just literally being like I don't like this type of bio like definitely don't like I'm happy to talk to you and I came because you invited me but I I don't like this type of bio like I, I don't don't uh and then we just spend the next like 40 minutes just talking about what was it that I liked in, in bio and like what kind of neuro I was in. And then in the end, uh, like, I don't remember a, a while later, they were just like, hey, we're going to give you research funding as if you were doing research in, in one of our labs over the summer. And that's actually how I, I did actually a stint at that lab where I ended up working later over the summer, fully funded by like the mud bio department. But I remember that just being like, Dan likes Mobile more than I do. I don't like this. Please don't don't consider me for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do remember that. <clears throat> yeah, I think that was a that ended up being the the summer research program I did in San Francisco that summer. Yeah, I was gonna say um, I have another bio memory. <laughs> Um, so yeah, going back to Professor David Asai, he was pretty legendary mud prof. If you've never heard of him, he would he's famous for giving lectures in his sperm costume, like a giant sperm costume, um, when he was teaching us about you know how the flagella move with microtubules and the motor, motor proteins, and so he would just show up, walk into the lecture hall, <laughs> just like like this. So funny, it's hilarious because he would just like you know keep a straight face like I'm normal, and then everyone would just be like cracking up and and um yeah I'll never forget that because that was so funny. It even had like a a cross section like he would open it up and you could see like a actual like molecularly correct cross section of a flagella of a sperm cell. It was so good, yeah. Boy, those are good. I don't. I don't think I can top any of that. Um, I'll never forget the the trip to the tide pools with Professor McFadden, and and that was really cool. And I still remember the totally random non sequitur, but just it's a small world. I spent um, the so spring semester of junior year abroad in Ireland, and I learned to play the Irish bagpipes when I was there. And it turns out that she's like a supreme Irish bagpipe player and. We went to some random Irish sessions in Southern California after I got back. So small world. Well, well thank you so much for closing those out with those fun stories. Um, so we are a little over time. So I just wanted to say thank you again to our panelists, Daniel, Dan, and Maureen for sharing your experiences and wisdom with us. And thank you to all of our attendees for being here. Uh, we'll follow up with an email with the YouTube link and contact information of our panelists if you want to connect, which by the way, uh, these would be great people to do some informational interviews with. 
Um, and we just want to share that OCS and APR will be hosting a similar panel with alumni talking specifically about their experiences in grad school in a couple weeks on Wednesday, November 8th from 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. Um, so please check your email. And then if you have any questions for future career related, career -related events, uh, you can contact career underscore services at hmc.edu. Um, so thank you once again to our panelists and Armand for moderating. And take care, everyone. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.